Europe is really known for their local marketplaces. Each country has a different one. Um, but actually, how to sell there is exactly the same for Amazon as it is for the other marketplaces. And what we find the most common thing is, is that Europe follows the US trends. So as soon as the US starts trending on something, then Europe follows. So by default, if you're doing really well in the US, I would definitely suggest that you start looking into Europe and the possibilities this can give to your, your market and your, you as a seller. Welcome fellow entrepreneurs to the Amazon Sellers School Podcast, where we talk about Amazon and how you can use it to build an e-commerce empire, a side hustle, and anything in between. And now, your host, Todd Welch. What's going on, everybody? Todd Welch here with Amazon Seller School. Welcome to uh, another episode. I have Natalia with me today. She's a business development manager at Avask. And Avask is one of the leading tax agencies dedicated to helping sellers like us based in the U.S. navigate and navigate the complexities and expand into Europe and UK, of course, and all the other countries that are in the EU. So Natalia, I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Todd. It's great to be here. As you mentioned, um, I worked for Avask. Um, Avask is an international tax agency. We do focus a lot of ta on taxation, but I just wanted to jump on here today to talk about the European market what this can offer you. And if you do want to expand into Europe, what the steps are that you can take to actually expand. So we'll talk about that today. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm curious how you got into this work and got into helping people with tax compliance and things, U.S. sellers especially, expanding to the EU? Um, well, I guess my background is international business. Um, so with international business and the world that we're in, at the end of the day, e-commerce is everywhere we look. So it was bound to happen at some point. Um, and I got into a VASC. We started expanding sellers um, from the UK to Europe to start off with, and then realized actually it's exactly the same to expand US sellers to Europe. So why not help you guys as well? We also do help sellers expand into other markets like Australia, UAE, KSA, but we can go into that a different time. Um, the biggest market out there right now is Europe. And I just want to try and help clients understand the market, understand what they need to do, because it's actually much more simpler than you think. Yeah. And I think it scares a lot of people in the USA, sellers. Uh, well, scare might be a little strong, but they're, they're worried about going to the European Union or the UK, Germany, wherever, because taxes and government and everything is is different than here in the united states so it adds an extra level of complexity so hopefully we can help people with that today and kind of give them a better idea on what it looks like when they do expand over there so first off i guess can you tell us a little bit about how the market is in the europe in europe right now in terms of e-commerce yeah Absolutely. So the e-commerce market in Europe is quite big. Um, everyone shops online just like they do in the US. It is true that uh, Amazon is the biggest marketplace that they have, but they also have local marketplaces. Europe's really known for their local marketplaces. Each country has a different one. Um, but actually how to sell there is exactly the same for Amazon as it is for the other marketplaces. So actually we'll go into a deep dive of how um, you can do this, but um, Europe is there ready for you. And what we find the most common thing is, is that Europe follows the US trends. So as soon as the US starts trending on something, then Europe follows. So by default, if you're doing really well in the US, I would definitely suggest that you start looking into Europe and the possibilities this can give to your, your market and your, you as a seller. 
Yeah, for sure. The the people that you are helping, do they have a typical size of their business in the U.S. already before it makes sense for them to expand to Europe? Yeah, there's no set algorithm as such, but I would say that you would have to be selling in the U.S. for a couple of years. That would just give you a baseline. It would give you enough reviews as well, because these reviews will then translate to the European market. So you don't start from scratch. Um, so ideally, you want to be selling for a couple of years. Having done well, um, I would definitely suggest because you just need that little bit of cash flow to expand into the European market and just to invest in the VAT numbers that will go into depth in a sec. Um, so there's time, just having sold for a, a bit of time and having the cash flow. Um, and I just want to make sure that all the sellers feel comfortable doing the expansion. The last thing you want is to make this big step and then regret it in, in the future. Um, so if you feel comfortable doing that and you have someone advising you, um, such as a VASC next to you, then I would definitely take the leap. Yeah. So when you say cash flow, are you meaning just having enough cash available? Because obviously you're going to have to add on additional inventory that's going to be sent over to Europe. Exactly. So have cash available is the key thing here. The a cash that you're willing to invest into this expansion, because it's not wasted cash. It's just an investment that you're going to have to do, um, such as the inventory that you mentioned. You need to start getting your VAT numbers, which um, has to do with taxes, um, shipping costs as well will add up and then translations of your listings and stuff. So it is a slight investment, but then I think it will pay you off. Yeah, for sure. And so it sounds like you're talking about like private label products that people have made, which is definitely a part of the listening audience. Um, but a lot of people also are selling other people's products on Amazon as well. Do you work with people like that also? Yeah, definitely. And it's the same principle. It's just having your setup ready and then you can do exactly what you're doing now in the US, but you just transfer it to, to Europe. So both would be absolutely fine. Yeah. And I, I think the EU is a good opportunity for private label sellers, but also could be a really big opportunity for a reseller like myself working with a company that's maybe selling really good in the US, but nobody's ever brought it to the EU. Yeah, exactly. And if no one's brought it to the EU, it's going to be in high demand um, because chances are Europeans aren't going to go onto Amazon.com or any US platform and buy from there because shipping costs are just going to be too much. Then there's going to be duties to pay for. So they just don't even go onto that website you want to be visible in the European websites so that people buy from you. Yeah. And by default, when you guys are shopping in the, the UK, for example, on Amazon, it doesn't give you the ability to buy stock that's in the US and pay for importing and duties and stuff, right? Like it does for Canada. Exactly. No, you would have to purposely go onto the Amazon US to be able to see those products. Yep. Okay. So essentially you're losing out on a, a large market if you're not available in the EU at all. Yeah, exactly. And we actually have a huge statistic here that only 2% of US sellers have expanded into Europe. So that just gives you an idea of the market. It's not saturated. It's ready for you to expand. And there's a whole bunch of clients waiting to buy your products. So yeah, and I think that is probably in part because we we're just so comfortable in the U.S. We have such a large market here, yeah, that we don't necessarily always think about expanding out to Europe. So we're kind of spoiled in the way, I guess, having such a a big market all in one, uh, which isn't normal throughout most of the markets that Amazon is in. Yeah, but if we do compare it. When we say, okay, fine, the U.S. It has all its states and you can sell to all the states, Europe has 27 countries. So you could be selling to an additional 27 countries. You could do that from one single country if you wanted it. Um, so the potential is definitely there. But maybe what it comes down to is just do people have the knowledge 
of how to actually expand. Yeah. And you're talking about the the Pan-EU program, right? Yeah. Where you can ship into, say, Germany? Yeah. And Pan-EU only includes seven countries. Okay. So I'm talking even further away from Pan-EU. Um Amazon focuses on the seven countries because it's the the biggest ones. But from those seven countries, you can also sell to additional ones, um, which adds to a total of 27. Okay. Yeah. And we're kind of getting in the the weeds a little bit uh, early here. So we'll kind of pull back and before we dive into that a little bit more. But uh, what are some of like the unique things in the European market uh, that are not necessarily the same in the U.S. market? Um, I would definitely say languages. Languages is something that's very different in Europe to, to the U.S. Each language, um, each country uh, speaks a different language, so you are going to trans- have to translate your listings into different ones. But once you've done that effort, um, you've gone through that effort of translating, you are tapping into markets that other people that haven't translated their listings aren't tapping into. So it is unique in that sense um, that you could be tapping into a new pool of clients completely that you didn't have before. So that's one unique thing. Um, Another one is what I was mentioning, that you could just be selling from one country in Europe and you could be selling to 27. So... I think a lot of people don't actually know that, that they think every country is completely different. You have to go through through the whole process again, 27 times. Well, actually, you could start small. You could start from one country and have 27 other countries buying from you. Start gathering that knowledge. Where are my customers coming from? Where are they normally buying from? And then that could be your next step. So I think those are the two unique things that I would say people don't really know about or people don't maybe analyze as much. Um, and it could be bringing them lots of potential. All right. So what? how are people selling in, in all 26 countries? Because I, I know about the, the Pan-EU, uh, but what's the program that is allowing them to sell in the 26? So it's not a program as such. It's just the legislation that's in place. So uh, to put it into perspective, when you ship into Europe, um, you have to go through the customs border. You're in Europe already. And then once you're in Europe, there's no borders between countries. So you don't have to go through customs again. Um, So once you're in Europe, everything's free movement. So that's where you can sell to the 27 countries because you're in already. Um, And then you have the flexibility that Let's, let's use an example. You ship into Germany and you're storing in Germany, but someone from Austria wants to buy from your inventory. That's absolutely fine. There's no customs border between Germany and Austria, so you can make that sale. So are they going to have be on separate sites, though? Because Amazon Germany has its own site. The UK has its own site. So if they wanted to buy from our stock that was in Germany, would they have to go to the German site or does Amazon automatically kind of bring them across all the countries? That's a good question. So you can make your listings visible in Austria, in my example, so that Austrian client could just go on to Austria and buy your product. It will simply go from Germany to Austria or you maybe don't want to list your products and then that Austrian client would have to go into Amazon Germany to buy your products. So ideally you want to list your products everywhere and then at least everyone has visibility of your listings and can decide to purchase. It's just the products are then just coming from a different country. Got it. So you you set up a seller central for each of the countries and add your product in there. Yeah. Then you say bring stock into Germany, perhaps, and then it will be available in all the countries, though. In all of them. But it it will work because um, a lot of people will say, OK, why don't I do the same thing? Open my listings up in Europe, but keep my inventory in the U.S. Yes, that is possible. But that client is probably not going to click on on your one or purchase your one because they'll see that the shipping comes from the U.S. Yeah. So that'll just be a blocker. Whereas you, if you do it from inventory already in Europe, 
it won't be a blocker and that client will buy the product. Okay. So is this something that's relatively new legislation? Because I feel like the last time I talked to someone about this, which might've been a couple of years ago, that wasn't the case that you could do that. I, it's not new as such, but I think it's becoming more popular. So more people are talking about it now. Um, whereas before everyone was really focused on the seven now it's it's a whole other world that you're looking at. You you have that flexibility of having more sellers. So I, my recommendation would be say don't just focus on the seven that Amazon um, promote. The seven are absolutely great, but think even further ahead. There's more countries out there that will be buying from you. Yep, definitely. Now I know before Brexit happened. UK was kind of the the holy grail to send all your inventory in in there because you know they speak English, we speak English. It was perfect. Um, but is that still the case post Brexit, or how is that working? Yeah, that's a, a great question. It is still up there with one of the biggest markets. It's on par with Germany. But the only downside of the Brexit was that the UK is no longer part of the EU. So we see it as two different um, territories. Mm -hmm. So the difference to all the sellers that we'll be watching today is that you would have to do two shipments. So from your manufacturer to the UK and then from your manufacturer to the EU. Before, it was amazing. Amazon used to send inventory from the UK to the EU and it was nice and simple. Um, the only difference now is you do two separate shipments. One stays in the UK and one is in those 27 countries. So there's just a, think of it as a, a customs border in between the two territories. Um, so to your question, it's still a great market and I still would recommend it, especially because of the language, but do bear in mind that it's separate to the EU. Okay, and you do find that is the best way to do it, sending from the US to UK and to say Germany versus just sending everything to Germany and then to the EU or to UK from there? Definitely, yes. And the main reason is because you don't want to pay double duties. So if you go from the US to Germany, you're paying once. And then from Germany to the UK, you're paying again. So I just want to avoid people having to do that twice. If you split up your shipments, then you just do it once. Okay. Yeah, so that's probably a, a good segue to kind of talk a little bit more about tax compliance, because that is probably the biggest thing that people worry about, especially, you know, the difference between sales tax that we have, the VAT tax that you have, it's a different way of uh, adding it into the product price. So tell us a, a little bit about that, uh, how, what things we need to watch out for and you know the best way to go about it, how you guys help with that, et cetera. Definitely. So the biggest, biggest thing to watch out for is exactly what you said, that sales tax is added at checkout, whereas VAT, which is if the equivalent of sales tax, we just call it VAT, we include that in our listing price. So whenever you're looking at competitors and you wanna ballpark where your products will be based, um, make sure that you remember that VAT is included in the listing price. Um, so that 20%, that 19% is already into that fee that you can see, is already built in that. You're not gonna add it on top. But the beauty about the US sellers is that Amazon will actually deduct this VAT from your sale. They'll pay it to the tax office and then you'll receive the, the rest of it. So everything you get is revenue, whereas Amazon have already dealt with the VAT for you. So I would say that's the biggest thing to look out for. And I'm curious how, what number are they calculating the VAT off of? Because if I'm selling my product for say 10 pounds and that includes the VAT tax, uh, are they calculating the VAT tax as a percentage of the 10 pounds, which already includes the VAT? So you're like, paying twice, I guess, or what number are they basing that off of? Yeah, they're basing it off your final listing price. So if you've sold it for 20 euros, they assume that that already includes VAT and they'll de deduct the 20% away and then give you the rest. 
which is why it's so important that you've already added that 20% so that when they deduct it, it's not being deducted from your money, but rather the client's money. And is 20% the typical amount that most of the countries there are at? Yeah, that would be the average. Um, It goes all the way down to 19 and it goes up to 23. It depends on the country, but as an average, we're seeing about 20%. So whatever you're going to sell it at, if you just take 20% off the top as an expense, you want to be calculating your profit or your ROI off of that number. Yeah, definitely. But the biggest thing here is just that the client pays for that 20% VAT. The last thing you want is this to be cutting into your margins. So by adding it onto your listing price, the client pays for the full price, including the VAT. Amazon takes the VAT away and then you receive the rest. Yeah, it's an important differentiation. You wouldn't want to sell your product for $10 or 10 pounds and then that 20% come out and you're like, oh my goodness, I don't have any margin left. Yeah, that was mine, yeah. Yes, for sure. Definitely. And now the other thing that I've heard of in the past is that when you're selling in Europe, if if you make sales in the UK and Germany and Austria and wherever else, Turkey or whichever countries that you then have to file taxes in each one of those individual countries. Is that still the case? So the case is you have to where you're storing the inventory so that if you could take something away from this podcast, it would be that you just need to be registered in the country where you store your inventory and where you are registered is where you have to file. So don't be fooled when they say you have to file everywhere you sell to before when I was saying about selling to 27 countries. Don't think that I'm trying to get you to file in 27 countries. That's not the case. You only need to be registered where you store and where you store and are registered is where you need to file. So that could be one country or it could be four. It's down to you. And is Germany the best place to store your stock in addition to the UK? It is the, it w- is what I was saying, is it's on par with the UK in terms of sizing. So it's not a bad start. I would definitely recommend the UK and Germany as your starting points. Um, but a tip, France actually has really good imports. So when you import into France, you don't have to pay what's called import VAT. Um, And I'll go into depth into this. Import VAT is completely separate to what we were just talking about. It's a VAT that you just pay when you import, as the name says, but you do get it back. Um, So you get it back no matter where you're importing. So if anyone's listening and they've paid for import VAT, just make sure that you know that you can claim it back and your tax advisor should be claiming this back for you. So... If you want to avoid having to pay import VAT, I would recommend you ship into France. Either way, you're going to get your import VAT back, but why pay for it when you can maybe not pay for it? So the UK and France are the only two countries in the whole of Europe that offer this scheme that you import and you don't pay for import VAT. It doesn't cost you anything extra. You don't need anything additional. You just have to import by the UK and France. So if you're worried about maybe the cash flow rather than Germany, I would maybe suggest France. Something good came out of Brexit and we don't have import VAT. All right, so the UK and possibly France or Germany, depending on where it makes the most sense. Because of course, if you're making a majority of your sales in say Germany, you might want to have inventory there because shipping is going to be faster, right? Yeah, exactly. So do think about, obviously, there's this tip about no import VAT, but if on in the long term, Germany is going to be a more beneficial country for you, just ship into Germany, you'll pay the import VAT, we'll reclaim it back for you. So you'll always have that back. Um, and what I was saying before, because you're importing, it then means that you're storing in that country. So you need to have the VAT registration for that country, just the ones that you're storing in. Now, is there a point at which it makes sense to start having more stock in more countries for that faster shipping or whatever the case may be? Exactly, exactly that. So that's when we start seeing people expanding more and more. They start gathering knowledge of where their customers are based and they start moving more inventory into that other country. 
And by doing that, what you're essentially doing is offering them next day delivery, same day de delivery and lower shipping costs um, because you're in that country. They require you to have a VAT number in that country, but you then have the inventory there and the customers can buy from you. Um, so that's when we start seeing what you mentioned, the pan-European program. And the pan-European program is one of the most popular from Amazon. And how it works is that you ship into one country, let's call it France, because there's no import VAT. Amazon then move your inventory into the other countries that you've selected. So you can say to Amazon, I'd like to include in my pan-European France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. Perfect. I have my four VAT numbers. Here they are. Please, can you do everything for me? So you ship into France and then Amazon will redistribute your inventory into the other three countries. You're now storing in four countries. You have access to all those sellers and Amazon has done everything for you. Yep. Then you got a, a lot more tax uh, compliance you got to deal with. But if you're working with a professional. It's great. Yep. For sure. So something to think about in the beginning, you're definitely going to want to focus on the UK and then either France or Germany. And then after you get the ball rolling and you're doing well, then contemplate if it makes sense to move into the other country. Yeah. And once you have data, there's no point expanding into Spain if all your clients are in Italy. So. And I just pulled up the, the population of the different countries so people have an idea on the markets. So the, the United States is 334 million people. Canada is about 40 million people. So most people in the USA are familiar with uh, Canada, the US and selling in those countries. Um, so the UK is about 67.7 million. So a little bit larger than Canada. France is about 68 million. And then Germany is about 84 million. So people can probably extrapolate off of their sales in the US and Canada and guesstimate what they might do in the EU in each of those countries. But of course, now in the EU, like you said, we're adding all those countries together. So we've got uh, I don't know. Do you know the entire population of the EU, what that is? I wouldn't know right now, um, but it's probably not too far off from the U.S. If we think about it in size, it's definitely smaller, but I would say it's maybe about 70, 80 percent of the size of the U.S. So think about that. If you're already making sales in the U.S. and it's going well, if you could double that by just going into Europe, I don't see why not. Yeah, so I, I just asked ChatGPT. So assuming that it's correct, it says the EU minus the UK, since that's they're no longer in it, is 448 million. So it's actually a larger population than the United States. Um, I think Amazon, correct. I think Amazon is a little bit less used in the EU than it is in the United States, but it's growing pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. But I also don't see that as a bad thing because if it's being not, it's not being used too much. If you start selling on Amazon now, you're more likely to get onto those first pages before everyone else does. Um, and then they're more likely to buy from you. Now, uh, you may or may not know this. So if not, that's fine. But do you know how the competition with uh, Chinese sellers is in the EU right now? Um, there isn't too much competition these days because there's been a lot of regulations put into place. Um, so having people like Avask help you has, I think, just made sure that everyone that's selling in the EU has everything in place, has all their bat numbers in place. So we're seeing less competition, whether it's from Chinese sellers or from US sellers, the, the competition is definitely lower. Um, so I think there hasn't been a, a huge boom um, for me to tell you that there's less Chinese sellers, but it's definitely even out the playing field and there's not as much competition anymore. Okay. Yeah. And that's a, another important thing I just thought of. Uh, don't assume just because your product is compliant with all USA laws that it's also compliant in the EU because you guys, of course, have your own set of regulations and laws and everything. So you'll want to 
make sure that's not an issue uh, depending on the product that you're selling. Yeah, definitely. The good thing is, is uh, there's loads of companies out there that could just look at uh, look at your product, look at your labels, and just make sure that they match with the regulations in place. Um, I do have to say we're not as strict. Um, as there's no huge thing that you'd have to do. Just make sure that the labeling is correct for the territory. Um, and we usually see that it's EU as a whole and then UK on its own. Um, so it won't necessarily be by country, but um, I'm not sure what products everyone's selling, but it definitely, if you sell supplements or anything that people eat, I would definitely make sure that you have the correct licenses for those. Um, for more generic products, it should be very simple. Yeah, is there gonna be particular labeling that you need to have, let's say for if you're selling a fishing reel or uh, shoes or something like that? Yeah, you'll definitely need a specific sticker that says that it's compliant with the regulations. So just make sure that you have that and your manufacturer can probably help you with this as well and make sure that when they're printing out the labels that they add this on. Okay. All right. Very good. So definitely something you'll want to look up and research a little bit. Is that something you guys help with people with as well? We don't specifically, but we can definitely send you some recommendations. Okay. Yeah. Definitely want to plan ahead. You don't want to get, you know, 10,000 units over there and then somebody says, Hey, this isn't compliant. And now you got to redo all your boxes or something. All right. Very good. Next thing we were going to talk about is some of the common myths of the EU market, which we might've touched on some of these already. So anything that we haven't touched on that people tend to believe about Europe that aren't true? Well, a lot of people tend to believe that um, just using ChatGPT to translate your listings is enough, um, but it's really not. If there's something I could recommend is that you Lo um, localize your listings to the language of the country, even the UK. I know, obviously, we speak the same language, but there are so many words that are different and you don't want to be making those mistakes. Um, we've seen all kinds. So definitely localize your listings would be one of the tips and slash myths that not everyone speaks in the same way. Okay. So you haven't seen that chat GPT is good enough yet to translate into different languages properly. It's a great start, um, but I wouldn't fully, fully rely on it. Um, there's so many good companies out there that can use what you have already translated and just make sure that it's localized to the actual country. Um, so yeah, I would say it's it's almost there, just not, not yet. It's a lot better than Google Translate for sure, especially if you tell it to translate into a specific region like if you tell it to translate into uk english or british english yeah. yeah it will do better but still not perfect oh for sure <laughs> it might uh it might it picks it up yeah i was just gonna say it might spell c-o-l-o-r instead of color with a u <laughs> yeah you never know yeah, definitely. But it's those kind of things that when the client Google is, searches it on Amazon, you want to make sure that yours pops up. Yeah. And you, and you want to have the language right, because here in the US, for example, we're used to looking at listings that are obviously put out up by somebody in China that doesn't speak English very well. And it's, it's very obvious uh, as soon as you start reading it. So you don't want your product to be on that kind of level. Exactly. Yeah. And then we also mentioned about the VAT. So you know that you need to add it onto your listing price and it's not being added at checkout. I think that would be the the next myth that a lot of people think. Um, and I guess another myth that people, well, you mentioned it, that you're going to need to have numbers everywhere that you sell and you need to file everywhere. And I'm just going to have to do the, everything I do with the IRS in the US. I'm going to have to do it per country in every single country I sell to, that's not the case. It's, it's honestly as simple as just decide where you wanna store. We'll help you get your VAT number. We'll do the filings for you as well so you don't have to do anything. And then you can start selling. Um, and I think my fourth uh, myth that I come across quite often is that people think that they need to register a new company. Register a new company in Europe, have a new bank account, have a new CPA, you don't have to do all that. 
with everything that you've established already and it's working well, use that company and then just get your VAT numbers in Europe and expand. You don't need to have a new company. Yeah, I definitely don't want to have a bunch of companies laying around and then have to file a million tax returns and everything else. All right. Very good. Uh, any other common myths or anything that we haven't touched on yet? Uh, nothing I can think of right now. I don't know whether past conversations you've had with uh, sellers, uh, common questions come up that I could maybe um, explain a bit in more detail. Well, I think the big ones we've covered most of them being tax related and then, you know, how much is my product actually going to sell over there? Um, one thing that I just thought of, so in the USA, if your product is made in the USA, that can be a benefit to people who are looking for that. Uh, the same can go for, you know, Germany has a, has a reputation of high quality, uh, Europe in general for like foods and things like that have a reputation of being more healthy. Is there any benefit of USA made products in European countries that are similar? It definitely depends on the type of product that you're selling. If clients are looking for specific wines, they might be looking, as you mentioned, for specific made products in Italy or Spain or France. If they're looking for cheese, they might go for French cheese. So I think for let's toys um, and household items are I would say the most popular items that sell in Europe. And if the client does see that they're made in the US, they might be more likely to buy it than if it's sold in if it's made in China or India. So it's just that sense of knowing where the product has come from. Um, so I would say yes, it does come as a benefit. But I wouldn't say it's a huge difference between one or the other depending on the product that you sell. Um, obviously, if we're talking about very niche products, they might be more leaning towards specific countries. Um, but I would say supplements is maybe the, the top one selling right now that I would see clients rather buying it from US made um, factories than anywhere else. Yeah, I could definitely see made in the USA versus say made in China or something. But I would think that they would even prefer more buying supplements that are made in, say, the UK or Germany or France or something. I see. I see what you mean. Um, it could be because it's locally made and they feel that um, link towards those products. Um, but I don't think it would be something that puts them off buying from elsewhere, especially because the US is known so much and trends, as we mentioned at the beginning, anything that is happening in the US, the Europeans want to follow. So if they see products like the Stanley Cup that started in the US, everyone then wants to have it in, in Europe. Um, so trends do follow. And that does lead me, I, I didn't really expand on it, but Europeans have local marketplaces. I know we touched upon Amazon quite, quite a lot, but there are other marketplaces that you could sell on even if your product is manufactured in, in the US. So for example, France has a, a website called C Discount. The requirements of selling are exactly the same. You just need to have your French VAT number to be able to sell on Amazon and on C Discount. So what I would recommend that the people expanding do is that once you have everything set up to sell on Amazon, you also sell on places such as C Discount, um, using France as an example. So you're breaking that barrier of saying, fine, my product is manufactured in the US, but I'm selling on your local marketplace. So now you see my product as a local product and you might be more likely to buy it. Yeah, definitely something to think about, kind of like selling on you know Walmart here in the US, the, the separate marketplaces. Do you know in the in Europe on the C discount, for example, would they allow you to fulfill the inventory from the Amazon warehouse for those orders? A lot of marketplaces have that integration that you could just store everything in the FBA and then link it up with their marketplace so that you can sell on that one as well. 
So it's much, much easier. Yeah, definitely something to think about then for sure. If it's easy like that, uh, you could definitely look at doing it if the sales are high enough. Definitely. And the regulations are exactly the same. So you're already set up. So now that we've got stock in Europe, yeah, maybe we got some stock in the UK and in France. What kind of tips do you have for people for scaling their business in the EU uh, that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah, so that's where I was mentioning about gathering that data um, because you can distance sell, see where most of your clients are based off of and use that as your next step. So that would be your first um expansion strategy once you're in Europe, moving on to new countries, storing in those new countries. And then expansion number two would be the marketplaces. Um, so once you're established in a, in a country, you've got everything set up, you're selling on Amazon, do that next step of selling on another marketplace. And then you've got, you can integrate everything into one place as well. So you could use integrations that are out there to manage everything from one place but you've already now expanded into more countries and expanded into more marketplaces all within Europe. Um, so those would be my two next steps once you're in the European market. Yep. Okay. Very good. And I'm curious, uh, obviously, as we've talked about it, we're going to need someone to help us with taxes and stuff like that. So for a service like that, how, what does a service like that run typically for a seller? It depends on the number of countries that you want to store in. Um, so all our pricing is based off of the, the number of countries. Um, you're going to want to think about the registration fee, which is just a one-time fee. And then we do have an on ongoing fee um, just to take care of your filings, as I was mentioning, so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, Obviously, if people want to reach out, I'm more than happy to give them a quote based on the number of countries that they've chosen. Our fee doesn't increase. It doesn't change. It's all a set fee based on the number of countries. So you don't have to worry about how many marketplaces you sell on, how much revenue you're making, um, nothing like that. It's all set so you know exactly how much you're spending on taxation, and then you can worry about doing the selling. Um, and a lot of clients, what they ask me is, okay, well, how does a day-to-day -day work? Well, we integrate with those marketplaces. So we have a, a system that can integrate with the back end of those systems. We pull out the sales reports from there, and then we'll file with the tax office. So you literally don't have to do anything. All right. Well, well, Natalia, this has been fantastic. A lot of really great information. If people want to get your guys' help, to move into the European Union or UK or wherever, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, the most simple way that you can do is just go on avask.com and then just fill in a form and one of the team members will reach out to you, coordinate a call. I think the best way to do this is to have a genuine call with you, see what you wanna do, see if you got any questions. Uh, the team will give you an exact pricing of what you what it would cost to expand, no commitment. And then if you feel like it's the right choice for you, then we can start everything. Um, so yeah, avast.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn if that's easier. Um, or Todd, I don't know whether you could put my email address somewhere and people can just reach out. By yeah, absolutely. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes, uh, your email, LinkedIn, and Avask as well, of course. So have a great one, everybody. This has been another episode of the Amazon Seller School Podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow Amazon seller. And always remember, success is yours if you take it.